Good evening, everyone. My name is Maggie Hausbeck, and I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Engagement and Career Services for the Hara College of Hospitality. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth episode of Salute Pros Cheers. If you've been with us since the beginning, you may remember that this digital series is the vision of our Hospitality Alumni Board. It's honestly been an adventure these last couple of weeks, orchestrating this program while working remotely. But we're so grateful you've joined us. You've welcomed us into your home from across the US, from here in Las Vegas, and all the way from Korea. You've shown us that ours is truly a hospitality rebel family. After tonight's episode, we'll be ending our quarantine edition of the series, but we will begin programming again in mid-June. We hope that you'll watch your inbox and please stay tuned to social media. Join us again in June. Um, one more thing before the show begins. Now, both Cook Like a Rebel and Salute Pros Cheers have been a huge labor of love and <laughs> a whole lot of work for the woman behind the Zoom controls, Candace Imam. So at the end of this episode, I want everyone to turn on their cameras and join me in giving her a big round of applause. Without further ado, I will bid you good sips. I will bid you good health until we see you in June. And I will turn you over to the capable hands of certified sommelier Chris Carroll from Las Vegas Valley Winery. Enjoy. How you doing? My name's Chris. Uh, I am a certified sommelier. I, you know, I've seen a, a, a few of these wine tastings, these virtual wine tastings uh, over the last couple of weeks, but this is the first time uh, I've had the uh, privilege to host one. So this is a, a first for me and hopefully, uh, hopefully things will go great. I hope uh, we're gonna go through two different wines. Uh, the first one that we have is a Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, the second one we have is a, uh, is a, a house blend uh, from Grape Expectations and it is 60% uh, uh, Barbera and 40% and Sangiovese. So I wanted to put those wines out what we're doing before we even get started. So if you have those exact wines, that would be outstanding as we go along with this. If you don't have those exact wines and you have something close or you, or you have, you know, say Sauvignon Blanc, obviously you can purchase it anywhere. If you've got a Sauvignon Blanc from somewhere else in the world or, or a different producer, that's fine. It will be a little bit different, of course, but, but we can still go along with this and, uh, uh, and have some fun. And, you know, this should be fun, uh, educational as well, but I'm going to try not to get, uh, I, I would call this tasting not, not real technical, not real uh, wine geeky, and I use geeky as a, as a loving term as I consider myself a, a wine geek. But um, I know some of you out there, are, there's different levels of wine knowledge, so we're going to keep this uh, kind of more to basics, but we're we're still gonna we're still gonna uh, have some good information there, but we're not gonna get uh, down to real technical. We're not gonna talk pH levels and things like that. Uh, so if you're just a wine enthusiast and you like having a glass of wine, uh, this this is for you. So we're gonna have a good time. So we're gonna start off with the uh, with the Sauvignon Blanc. So if you have your Sauv Blanc uh, with you, go ahead and pour yourself a glass. Uh, you know, there's two things, uh, two things that you're always going to want to know about a wine, and that's uh, what varietal it is and where it came from. So where it came from is a, is a very important thing, uh, and, and as we'll go through. But uh, Sauvignon Blanc, to me, is, is kind of a chameleon of a wine. It's going to change uh, characteristics uh, depending on where it came from. Uh, there's three places in the world uh, that you're, you're going to see most of your Sauvignon Blanc come from. And that is California, from France, and from New Zealand. And each one of those has their own different characteristics. So today we're drinking uh, one from California. So Sauvignon Blanc originates uh, from France, from the Bordeaux region. Although, like I said, it's, uh, by now it's an international grape. It's grown pretty much everywhere in the world, uh, both New World and Old World. Uh, uh, the one we have today is from... Uh, from uh, these grapes come from Sassoon, California. Sassoon is right up on the uh, the southeast end of Napa. It actually borders Napa, so so it's uh, it's right up there. It's a popular growing region, and uh, here at uh, Grape Expectation Vegas Valley Winery, we we get a lot of grapes uh, up from the Sassoon area. So let's go ahead and uh, 
I don't want to put off tasting too long. So let's go ahead and taste this. And uh, you know, like I said, if you're an experienced wine person, just bear with me and we'll go through some of the basics here. But if you get that wine, the first thing you want to do is twirl it in your glass. Some people uh, have a hard time twirling wine in a glass. It's tough for them. So if that's you, what you do is just set that wine on the table. Hopefully you can see that and just do a little circle there with your wine on the table and you can keep it in the glass without spilling it. So what you're doing is basically aerating wine. So when you're making the wine and the wine is being bottled, air is the enemy. You wanna keep, uh, keep your wine away from air. However, once it's time to drink and now you're doing it, now you wanna bring all the air in and aerate it and open up those aromatics and those flavors. So we'll take our, we'll take our Sav Blanc. And like I said, this is from California. Uh, it is a 2017. It is a young wine and it's, it's meant to be drank young. If you're drinking a Sauvignon Blanc, it's not made to be five, 10 years old. Matter of fact, uh, most of them, if they're five years old, they're probably gonna be past their prime, depending on a, a few things and where it came from. But, uh, but you should be looking uh, at about a two year old wine most of the time if you're drinking a Sav Blanc and that's, that's where you should have it. So after you aerate it a little bit, first thing you wanna do is take a good, uh, take a good sniff of that wine and go ahead and stick your nose right down there in the glass. It's perfectly socially acceptable. It's like, you know, you're supposed to do it. That's really the way you want to grab it is get the pour it in there and see what you get on that wine. And, and, and I'll tell you, uh, for this particular wine, uh, what I would get is as opposed, like I said, this is from California. So as opposed to a New Zealand where we're all seeing a lot of Savoie come from or France, the first thing I get when I stick my face in this is big, citrusy, tropical fruit. Uh, that comes before anything else. If, if you've got a glass of Sav Blanc and it's from New Zealand, uh, you're gonna get more of a green, uh, what I would call the green aromas. You're gonna get uh, cut grass, uh, really a lot of green bell pepper. You're gonna smell those things. And what those green things are is called parazines. And when you smell those green, those green smells, uh, you're gonna get those parazines. They will tend to come from cooler climates. So in California, a warmer climate, you're not gonna get so much of those parazines. You're gonna get more of that, uh, I get more, uh, more of a peach, more of a peach uh, type of fruit coming through. Some stone fruit type of things with some tropical uh, little there as well. So uh, in New Zealand, uh, most of the Sav Blanc is gonna come from uh, Marlboro, which would be the north end of the South Island, which is a cooler climate than California, and it's going to get you those really green uh, type of flavors and, and uh, aromas. Uh, in France, uh, there are several places that have Sauvignon Blanc, but uh, most of it that you're going to see is Sancir uh, or uh, uh, Pouille Fumé. If you if you if you drink your Sancir, you know it's going to say Sancir on the bottle, but it is in fact Sauvignon Blanc, and that that uh, come across. And I, I love Sancir. Uh, it comes across to me a lot more mineral, a lot more earthy. Uh, it's it's also a considerably cooler climate than uh, uh, New Zealand or California uh, in that particular area of France, which is the, the Loire Valley. But uh, when you smell that, you're going to get more of that earthy smell. And when you taste it, you're going to get more of that uh, kind of kind of licking a limestone, sort of a, a minerally uh, type of a very crisp, very crisp one. So let's go ahead and uh, if you've already taken a sip, I imagine you probably have, but let's let's go ahead and do that. And uh, first thing I, I always think, what's the first thing that gets you when you taste it? I mean, there's going to be a lot of flavors, a lot of aroma. For, uh, for me, I get grapefruit uh, on this one right off the bat. I'm going uh, right to grapefruit, uh, a little bit of pineapple, not quite as tart as grapefruit, uh, definitely some pineapple. So we've got some, uh, there's some lime, some lime in there. I'm definitely getting, uh, especially on the nose, I get like a, a tangerine. There's, some, there's definitely some citrus type of things going on. Uh, a great wine. And you know, another reason to love Sav Blanc is it's very inexpensive. Even if you're buying the best uh, Sav Blanc money can buy, you're talking probably about 25 bucks a bottle. 
So, and I mean, that will get you, uh, you know, uh, Cloudy Bay from New Zealand, uh, San Sir from France. I mean, you're in the 20s there. Uh, a lot of them from California uh, as well. And speaking of California Sauvignon Blanc, let's talk just a little bit about something you may have seen on the bottle, and that's Fumé Blanc. So Fumé Blanc is, in fact, just Sauvignon Blanc. And what happened, uh, it, it, most people have probably heard of uh, Robert Mondave, certainly one of the most uh, critical uh, wine pioneers for American wine ever. Uh, he was, a, uh, amongst other things, a marketing genius. And, and back in the uh, 70s, the 80s, Sav Blanc was not selling well in America. And being a marketing guru, he thought part of the problem was probably the name of it. You know, Sauvignon Blanc, it, it wasn't easy to say. It didn't flow. People weren't familiar with it. So he came up with Fumé Blanc, gave it the same name, and bam, it, it took off. It worked. And it became popular. And you'll still see some... Uh, that are that are marked Fumé Blanc. It's the exact same thing. Um, a lot of times, uh, Fumé Blanc California will use will use oak on their on their Sauvignon Blanc. Now, there's places in the world that uh, will will use oak with it, and places that will not use oak with it. So, uh, depending on where you're getting your Sauvignon Blanc from. Uh, you, you're going to have to taste it and say, is there oak on that? Uh, when I taste this one, uh, I'm not getting oak. If, if you have the, the same one that I'm drinking right now, that's going to be an unoaked one. Uh, it's, it's made in stainless steel, uh, which is fine. Uh, the producers, not in the winemaker, aren't looking for an oak flavor on it. Um, if you get Sauvignon Blanc from Bordeaux, France, it's probably going to have oak, and that's going to bring a lot of different uh, flavors to the table than you would see uh, from the California version. So, so this one is unoaked, and like I said, let's uh, go ahead and have another taste of that. And uh, other than the flavors, let's talk about the structure of this wine a little bit. The structure, or what we refer to as the body, and the first thing, uh, the most important thing that jumps out to me in this which I think you're going to see in pretty much any Sav Blanc, is uh, the acids. Acids are, are very high. Um, just in case you're not familiar with acids, a couple terms we use, acids and tannins. Acids would be what makes your mouth water. You know, when you take a sip of it and you're getting that mouth watery type of, type of thing, uh, that's acids. I would use as an example, if you were to drink a glass of grapefruit juice, that's probably the most acidic thing I can think of. So it's, it's really going to make your mouth uh, water up. Tannins, on the other hand, which there are no tannins in white uh, because they come from the skins of red grapes. But tannins are just the opposite. They're going to be the, the drying uh, sensation that you get in your mouth. So we're not going to talk about it, any tannins further until we get to the, get to the red. But uh, there's definitely, I would call the, the acids on this, High, we usually rate things, you know, uh, medium, medium plus, high, so forth. But uh, without getting too technical, these are these are clearly high acids. And uh, so we talk about what what would you have? What type of food might be good with a with a high acid wine like this? And I'll tell you something that goes great with a high acid wine like this, and that's. Uh, a cheese, and not just any cheese, but but uh, a goat cheese. So I have a goat cheese here. It usually comes in in a log type of a type of thing. You can spread it on a cracker. Have a little bit of uh, goat cheese. And the goat cheese is very fatty. It really wants to uh, stick to the side of your mouth. So any of the the cheeses that are very creamy, very fatty, very thick, those would match well because those acids cut through that fat and they pair excellently together. They kind of balance things out. High acid, high fat goes together, goes together perfectly. So moving on from the acids, talk a little bit about the uh, more of the, the structure of the wine, and that's, what about the alcohol level? 
we think we usually don't that's something we usually don't think about wine we usually just think it's wine and therefore it has the same alcohol level but it really doesn't and with this one this is going to be kind of a moderate uh, alcohol level I want to say uh, uh, probably about 13 5 13 8 percent alcohol which is kind of in the middle it's not real high it's not not real low and the way you can can detect that when you're drinking your wine is by the heat that goes when you swallow it. Now, alcohol is one thing you really need to swallow the wine to, 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 to uh, get the idea of it. But how much heat do you feel going down? When you drink this, it, you know, it doesn't come across real high or hot, as we like to say. It's not hot, but there's definitely some alcohol there. I can feel a little bit going down. And think of it like this. If you, if you've, uh, if you take a shot of whiskey, which is, of course, you know, we're talking high 40s percent alcohol as opposed to 13 and a half. Think of how that whiskey burns going down. I mean, that's an extreme example, but you see how you would gauge the uh, the alcohol in the wine. So the alcohol is 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 about medium. Um, so you've got nice nice acids, nice high acids on that tannins. It's uh, it's a great wine. It's affordable. It pairs with a lot of things. I mean, you don't have to have goat cheese. Uh, it pairs well, I think, with seafood, uh, buttery seafood. Uh, certainly, say lobster with uh, with a lot of butter on it. That type of thing. I, which sounds great right now. I have, I wish I had a little bit of that, but uh, it's also what I would call a summertime wine. I think. Uh, I think wines, drinking the wines, sort of have a season to them. And I think uh, Sauvignon Blanc is certainly a summertime wine. And a way that I can demonstrate that is if you compare it with food, uh, if you came home on a hot, hot day that just kind of wore you out, would you want to sit down to a nice big bowl of steamy beef stew? No. Well, it's the same type of thing, even if you haven't thought about it. Just as there are foods, can you have your summer foods and your your winter foods? Uh, you know, on a cold winter's night, a bowl of hot beef stew is probably awesome. But uh, like I said, this is more of a summertime wine. You could drink it by itself uh, in the back, in, excuse me, in the backyard by the poolside, uh, just to have a glass of, uh, of wine. Uh, it's a perfect, perfect wine for that. Okay, I haven't, like I said, this is uh, my first, my first uh, uh, virtual wine tasting, so b bear with me on the technical end. So I was wondering if there's any questions uh, out there, because we, we've covered quite a, quite a bit there on just, ha on just the one wine. But uh, uh, I don't see any, I don't believe, so. Yep, there are no questions just yet, Chris. I don't see anything on my end either. Okay, excellent. Uh, so we're going to move on uh, from Sav Blanc. If there's anything that comes up later, when we're all done, we can go back and re-explore any any of these uh, any of these wines. So we're going to move on uh, from white to red. And whenever you're doing a wine tasting, or if you go to a wine tasting uh, where there's many wines available, always go from the lightest wines first to the heaviest wines because once you've gone to a heavy red wine, there's kind of no going back. Anything, if you, anything you drink from that point is going to taste uh, flat, floppy, watery because you've had such a big, fat, healthy, juicy wine that you don't. It doesn't do it justice to go back. So try as best as you can to, to keep things in order. Do your do your whites first, your lighter wines first, and if you're doing sparkling wines. Uh, those should be very first. Uh, I know when I go out to uh, dinner with friends and I, we have a whole ton of wine, we'll usually start off with a sparkling, uh, whether it's champagne or some California sparkling wine or cava or sec or whatever it might be. We'll do that first and then, then go into the whites and then the reds. Okay, so moving right along. We are going to go to a pretty interesting wine here, and I'll tell you right off the bat, you won't see a lot of these because this is a, a Barbera. Uh, 
uh, and primarily a Barbera mixed with, mixed with Sangiovese. So uh, Barbera is an Italian grape. Uh, it's primarily from, it grows uh, all over Italy, really, but uh, primarily the heartland of Barbera is uh, northern Italy, both on the east and west side. Uh, probably uh, Piedmont is, is the, probably the heart and soul of, of Barbera, of the Barbera grape. So uh, it is Italian, and it also, uh, obviously, pretty much everybody knows Sangiovese, Sangiovese originates uh, from Italy as well, but we see Sangiovese in a lot of places, but not so much Barbera. Uh, this Barbera is is interesting because it uh, it comes from California, as does this particular Sangiovese. So they're going to be uh, the same grape, but you're going to get different qualities from them as if you've got it if you've got them from uh, from Italy. So if uh, if you wanted to go find Barbera, I would uh, suggest if you. Uh, go to your local store. I don't, you know, I don't know which ones are in your area, but uh, if you need help, somebody could could help you. Or look for the uh, Northern Italy or the Piedmont section is probably where you're most likely uh, to find some Barbera. So, uh, like I said, this Barbera comes from California. So if we look at if, if we look at uh, the terroir. And that's a word you can throw in your uh, in your vocabulary if it's not already in there. Terroir, terroir is basically everything. It's a sense of place. It's everything from that place that influences the wine. It's the soil. It's the amount of rain that comes in. It's the amount of wind that's uh, blowing in what direction. What else is in the area? Uh, uh, is it next to a river? There's there's just a million things that make every place. All together individual and all of that together is known as the terroir so if we look at the terroir of northern Italy it's going to be quite different from the terroir of California and that's why even though they're the same grape they're going to come across with different qualities now this Barbera and this Sangiovese both come from Paso Robles California which you probably have uh, uh, probably are familiar with as a wine drinker. So some people say Paso Robles, some people say Paso Robles. It's fine either way. It just depends on your heritage and where you're from. So however you like to say it is fine. Um, I say Paso Robles, that's just me. Uh, Paso Robles is a, uh, a an interesting place. And I'll tell you what, what it is. Uh, first thing that comes to mind for me is it's absolutely huge. It is huge. We're talking uh, over 600,000 acres of wine producing uh, land. Now that's about three times, a little more than three times what Napa is. So being that the land is so huge, there are also a considerable amount of microclimates in there. So it would be wrong for me or anybody to say, the weather in Paso Robles, the terroir in Paso Robles is this, because it's so big, it's got so many microclimates that it really has everything uh, to offer. Uh, historically, it has been kind of the, uh, the, the stepchild, if you will, to, uh, to Napa and Sonoma. But what we see is that Paso Robles is really starting to up their game. They've gotten better and better and better. And even as recently as the last five years, things have just changed there. Uh, you know, they're figuring it out, which uh, takes a while, and they're figuring out how they can best use the terroir there. And there's been uh, a lot of incredibly uh, skilled people uh, involved in developing the wines there. And these are not the same wines uh, that were coming out of Paso Robles 10 or even five years ago. They've really, they've really uh, upped their game. So uh, Paso Robles is located about in the center. If you look at uh, LA on the south and San Francisco on the north, Paso Robles is going to be kind of right in the middle, uh, a little bit inland. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of good grapes, a lot of interesting things coming out of there. So uh, as far as the grape Barbera, about 95% of it in the world comes from Italy. So this came from California. So uh, 
uh, you might be hard pressed to find a, uh, a Barbera from California in your local wine store. Uh, they do exist, they're out there. I mean, pretty much any grape you can think of anymore, somebody in California is growing it. Whether they're doing good things with it or not, you know, is another story, but uh, they're certainly doing good things with it in uh, Paso Robles. Uh, and the other, the other 40% of this wine is uh, Sangiovese, which also hails from Italy, as we know. If you, uh, for those of you who may be uh, newer to wine, if you're drinking uh, Chianti or Brunello, you're drinking Sangiovese, but because it's from the old world, uh, they name it by place rather than by varietal, whereas here uh, in America, we, we put the varietal right there on the front label, just two different ways of doing it. But uh, uh, if you're thinking Sangiovese, think Chianti. That's basically what we're looking at. Now, uh, Barbera and Chianti, or excuse me, Barbera and Sangiovese are similar, uh, but what I would say is, is everything that Sangiovese is. Let's talk a little bit about that. Sangiovese, it's a lighter wine. Uh, it doesn't look like a glass of black ink. If you look down through your wine glass, if you have this wine, or if you have another uh, Chianti or Sangiovese, you will see that you can see uh, the stem of your glass looking down through the wine. It's light in color. Uh, light in color does not mean light in flavor. A lot of people often think that, but uh, don't be confused with light in color, light in flavor. But it's a very, uh, it's a ruby color. So when we're looking at red wines, we want to say uh, what color they are. We're basically, you can kind of put them into three camps. There's a ruby color, uh, as this is. There's purple. Uh, if you want to see a purple wine, go get a young Zinfandel. That is a glass of purple wine. Uh, and there is uh, garnet. Garnet would be kind of like that rusty red brick color. Uh, you'll see it on older wines, and you'll see it also on wines that come from uh, the old world. Uh, oftentimes, get uh, Rioja or Bordeaux. Uh, that's where you're going to see uh, you're going to see that garnet color. So, so this is clearly uh, a ruby color. Uh, it's the intensity or the darkness is 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 not it's not dark. It's it's uh, it's minimal. Um, when I stick my nose in there, let's see what we get on this. Okay, I'm getting, uh, what, I, what I get, what jumps out at a couple of things, actually, but let's talk about this first. Uh, I get red, red fruit on it. Uh, I'm not getting blueberries. I'm not getting blackberries. Uh, I'm not getting some of those that you would get in, in most, uh, like a California, say a California Zen, a California Cabernet. I'm not getting those. I'm getting red. I, I get... Uh, uh, I, I get raspberry, I, I get strawberry, and uh, let's go ahead and take a sip and what you, see what you get. Okay, before I say anything, just kind of get a few ideas in your head and think of what red fruits you like to get. Uh, I'll tell you what jumps out at me more than anything is I'm getting a cranberry on it. Uh, a cranberry, a dry strawberry. I'm also getting some non-fruit flavors, which uh, will also happen in wine. And as far as non-fruit flavors, I'll tell you what I'm getting. I'm getting like a, a, a potpourri, uh, a dried, dried red flowers, uh, uh, fall leaves, Think of that pile, uh, if you were a kid, that pile of uh, red and brown leaves uh, that you used to jump into and uh, as they had fallen off the trees in the fall time. And that's kind of, kind of what I'm leaning for with this. Uh, I don't have an Italian uh, Barbera in front of me, but I, I, would tell you, uh, I would tell you this, those earth flavors, those uh, leaves, mushrooms, uh, turn to earth. Those flavors are going to come through a lot more in an Italian wine than a California wine. Uh, the California wine sees a lot more sunshine, and it's going to lean more towards uh, the fruit, the fruit end of things. 
So I, I would say this, uh, this is light uh, red fruit. Now I'm also picking up, and, and this is something, unless you have this exact bottle, it's, it might be a little bit hard for you to relate to, but I'm also getting something else really, really interesting in this wine, and it's, it's definitely there. And, and I'm getting kind of a smoked flavor. And when I say smoked, I mean like if you can imagine a smoked meat, barbecue smoke, uh, how you get that pork shoulder and it's got a smoke to it. There's definitely a little bit of smoke going on in this wine. There's no doubt about it. And uh, there's really two different ways that that can happen. Uh, primarily, the reason you'll get that in a wine is it comes from the barrel. Is uh, The barrels are uh, toasted on the inside. Uh, if you're a spirits drinker, bourbon and so forth, they'll actually char the inside. Well, they don't go quite to a char with wine. They'll buy it uh, at a toasted level. And the customer who buys the barrel can request the toast. And I, I think these came from uh, a medium plus toast. So there is uh, definitely some, some barrel on that. And that's where if you get a smoky taste in your red wines, that's most all the time where it's going to come from is the barrel. But I think we've got something uh, pretty, pretty cool going on in here. And that is that uh, this doesn't come across quite like barrel smoke. This is more like forest fire smoke. And uh, this is from, this particular wine is from 2016. And in that year, there were several uh, forest wildfires in uh, the Paso Robles region. And what happened is when those fires burn, that smoke goes into those vineyards and that those grapes will pick up that smoky uh smoky flavor um there's really nothing a winemaker can do to get rid of that once it's there uh the the best example of this is if uh is if you could find a 2008 they're mostly uh, unfortunately gone now but if you could find a 2008 from uh, uh northern napa northern sonoma anderson valley which is right above them you get some serious, serious smoke. I mean, it's like drinking a glass of barbecue. And uh, a couple of uh, enterprising vineyards even changed the name of their wine for one season uh, to reflect the, bat, the fact that it was smoky. And uh, I'll tell you, one of them changed their name to Ring of Fire. I mean, marketing brilliance. Um, for, for me, I liked it. I, I think it gives the wine character. I think it speaks of the time and place that it was at. I don't think it's so strong, that is, especially in this one. I don't think it's so strong that it's overcoming what the wine should have been. Uh, now, in 2008, I think that happened some. Uh, I think it was probably smoky to a fault. And in fact, most of the white grapes uh, were thrown away that year because they were just uh, the smoke was just too overwhelming, and they, they just uh, had to take the loss on it. But on here, I think there's just enough uh, uh, forest fire on this just to add a little personality to it. And I, 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 I like that. I think, it's a, I think it's a good thing. Let's talk about if, there is, uh, if there's oak on this wine. Well, I'll tell you this to start with. Most, the vast majority of red wines that you have, uh, that you'll drink are going to have, they've probably been aged in oak. Uh, I say probably, there's always uh, exceptions. Most all of them are going to age in oak, kind of like uh, the barrels that you see behind me. Uh, so the next question uh, would come up is, well, what kind of oak and how long was it in there? Because those are going to have uh, a big effect too. Uh, this is particular wine is aged in American oak. And uh, the other main oak that you'll see around the globe is French oak. Um, there is a difference between the two in taste. Uh, it can be difficult to uh, differentiate between the two, but I would, in its simplest form, I'd put it like this. If you're smelling wood shop uh, type of uh, type of smell, like somebody was out there cutting two by fours, and there's that that woody smell, that smoky smell, that barbecue. That's probably American oak. Uh, if you go towards French oak, you're going to get more baking spices. You're going to get some vanilla. Not that American oak can't throw some vanilla; it can. But uh, with the French oak, you're going to get more vanilla, 
uh, more allspice, uh, cinnamon you'll find, especially on uh, some of the Pinot Noirs. So you'll see a difference in those oak. Uh, another thing that I uh, found uh, here at our winery is we've been using some uh, Hungarian oak, uh, which has been a great lesson for me because uh, one thing I've, you usually when you're drinking a wine, we seldom know uh, what kind of oak was used. However, uh, you know, I had the benefit of working in a winery and I could see that it was Hungarian oak. And uh, I noticed it throws a tremendous amount of vanilla. I think some people would say vanilla to a fault. Uh, I don't, I like it. I think it tastes really good. It's a nice accent on the wine. There's clearly some vanilla there. So uh, Hungarian oak is out there. Um, there are some places in the world that favor one oak over the other if you don't know what you're drinking. Um, uh, let's go to the obvious one. If you're drinking from France, you're probably drinking French oak. Um, but it's not that simple because if you're in America, you may be drinking American or French oak. I, I think in if we go to Napa, I'm going to say it's pretty even. There's probably as much French oak as there is American. Uh, I'll tell you that a French oak barrel costs more. Uh, I haven't looked at the exact pricing lately, but uh, these barrels are not cheap. An American oak barrel runs about $1,000. And for a French oak, you're looking at about $1,800. So uh, almost twice as expensive to use uh, French oak. So can you use a barrel over and over again? Yes, absolutely you can. Now, every time you use that barrel, it's going to impart a little less, a little less, a little less flavor on that wine. And after about five years, the barrel will be called what we call neutral, and that it will still work as a vessel to hold wine and age wine. But as far as giving oak flavors, it's given everything that it can give, and there will be uh, no more flavor to it. Uh, some high-end wines want that new oak flavor and what they'll do is they'll use it once and then they'll sell it to another producer who uh, either doesn't have quite the financial backing that the the first guy does or they are not looking for as much oak on their wine. So it, and, and a lot of that is just a, a matter of, of preference. Um, on white wines it's pretty easy to detect oak. On red wines uh, it, it's tougher. It's tougher. And then as far as differ differentiating what type of oak, uh, it's just practice. You just got to keep uh, you keep tasting wine. What's wrong with that? You know, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. But uh, there's definitely a difference between the two. So I, I think going back to this wine, uh, the Barbera and the Sangiovese, I, I think they work well together. And, and I think... Uh, I think what the Barbera brings to the table, to that Sangiovese, it's a little bit darker. It's a little bit rounder, a little bit richer, a little bit fruitier uh, than Sangiovese is. So like I said, Sangiovese is a very light wine. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, just realize where you're at with the wine. And I think the Barbera, uh, it darkens it up. Uh, it may be maybe appeals to more people uh, that don't want to see their wine so light, uh, possibility, but it definitely brings something to the, to the table. And with, uh, with the 60-40 with the blend, I think it just, it, it really worked with these two. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're brothers in the vineyard. Uh, they both come from Italy, from the same type of terroir. And it's, it's not surprisingly, uh, not surprising that they would mix well together. Uh, I've seen some blends that you look at and you just kind of go, I don't know who thought that was a good idea, but it's their wine. <laughs> they can do what they want. But uh, but these these two work together. So talk about a little bit of food pairing. Uh, what I, what goes great with uh, with this glass, I, I think, are, are cold cuts like uh, salami. And uh, the Italians have a uh, uh, basically a salami that uh, – that, that, the nickname is Soupy. They call it Soupy. And uh, it's, it's short for something else Italian. I, I don't remember the full name of it. Somebody out there probably does. But uh, it goes great with, with this. Uh, let's talk about the tannins a little bit. If you'll take a sip, 
whether you have this or another red wine. After you take a sip, lick the front of your teeth and up in your gums. You get that chalkiness, that stickiness, that dryingness. Uh, that's tannins. Um, if you would think uh, something that you might drink all the time other than wine, uh, like tea has tannins in it too, but it's that, it's that drying stickiness. And uh, they're, not, uh, they're not particularly strong in this particular wine. They're certainly there, and you can tell them. Uh, if any of you drink uh, Barolo, that would be a very tannic wine. Those tannins are coming through the ceiling. Man, your tongue wants to stick to the roof of your mouth uh, when you drink it. Nothing wrong with Barolo. I love it. But uh, as far as the tannins, that would definitely be the high end. So when you're eating, eating something like uh, salami, it's got a lot of fat in it. And fat goes great with uh, with those tannins because you know fat being you know it's it's uh, it's it's rich and uh, slippery if you will and that drying effect of those wines uh, really even it out nicely so you don't want to take it uh, your wine in too too much of a direction uh, you know you don't want it too tannic you don't want it to have to be too acidic so if you have a wine. And the red wines have acid too. If you can get those acids and tannins to kind of meet, complement each other without one just completely bowling over the other, that's when they say a wine is balanced. It's got good balance to it. The tannins are not killing the acids. The acids are not killing the tannins. It's got, it's got good balance. So if you do have a wine uh, like a, uh, a Barolo, uh, have, where the tannins are, are clearly dominant, uh, have it with... Uh, you know, so, uh, salami, uh, something something fatty. That I know uh, wild boar is, is very uh, big in Italy and, and pork and uh, things like that that will go good uh, with those tannins. You know, we have a, a phrase when pairing wine and food, and that's uh, what grows together goes together. So if you have wine and food from the same region, they will tend to complement one another. Uh, for example, if you look at Oregon, uh, a lot of Pinot Noir coming out of Oregon. Also, a lot of salmon coming out of Oregon. And if you have an Oregon Pinot Noir and an Oregon salmon, you're going to see that they complement each other. And, uh, you know, it goes back to what grows together goes together. And they've been doing that in France since uh, they've been keeping records of food and wine. So, uh, you know, you've, heard, you've probably heard of, you know, beef burgundy. And, and uh, you know, coca vin with uh, with Pinot Noir with Burgundy wine uh, it's because they go together. They they've they've been together that way forever. So uh, I think it uh, I think it, it it serves itself well to go with the uh, the sausages and so forth. And uh, I'd like to uh, take a moment if anybody has any questions. Uh, hopefully, I can uh, do them justice. Do we have anything out there? Yes. Um, so someone would like to know, what is the difference between a Chianti and a Sangiovese? Okay, a Chianti, uh, Chianti is, of course, a place in Italy. And when you buy a bottle of Chianti, it's, it must be a minimum of 70% Sangiovese. So Sangiovese is the actual great varietal. Chianti is the place where they use that varietal. And the Chianti is actually a recipe. It must be a minimum of 70% uh, Sangiovese. If it's Chianti Classico, it must be a minimum of 80% Sangiovese. But they will use other blending wines in there. They, they are allowed as long as they meet that minimum of Sangiovese. Uh, remember with Italy, there are more varietals in Italy than any place in the world. There are a Shocking number, uh, most people would, uh, as they find out, there's between 800 and 1,000 varietals of wine in Italy. We tend to focus on about 10 of them or so forth, but uh, they're, they're definitely there. A lot of them used in blends and so forth. So uh, I'll see a bot. you know, it's funny because I'll see a bottle of California wine. Sometimes they'll call it uh, Chianti. Well, it's, it's not. They kind of borrowed the name. Uh, where it's just Sangiovese. Uh, if you want 100% Sangiovese, if you get a uh, Brunello di Montalcino, you'll see that the Brunello is is not, it does not allow mixing with the Sangiovese and it will be 100% uh, Sangiovese. 
I hope that uh, hope that answers the question. Anything else out there? I don't see anything else just yet, Chris. Okay. Well, we're at about 547. So uh, I don't know about you guys. I had fun. And, <laughs> and now that I've started my night, I'll probably uh, continue to drink some of this uh, outstanding house, uh, house blend wine. And if anybody has anything. Uh, Chris, are we going to talk about the sangria a little bit? Oh, sure. Let's talk about sangria. A lot of people, uh, you know, the thing is, once you, I, I always say, once, once you open a bottle of wine, you've made a commitment because it's really not going to last uh, very long. Uh, a white will tend to go longer. If you recork a white and put it in the refrigerator, you might get a couple days out of it. Uh, I think with a red, once you crack it, if you put the cork back in airtight, you put it back in the fridge, you might get another day. That's about it. But you, once you open it up, you've definitely made a commitment. So one of the things that you can do with your wine is make sangria. So there are, are tons of uh, sangrios. Sangria is a, a fun thing because you can fool with the recipe uh, to make it whatever you want. So let me, let me read you the recipe that I have here. And this is uh, from the Vegas Valley Winery. And that's, uh, they use a bottle of the house cuvee, the uh, La Casa cuvee that uh, we've been drinking. Uh, third a cup of brandy or rum. Three to four tablespoons of brown sugar. Three cups of orange juice. And then you could cut up some oranges and uh, apples and whatever fruit you desire and, and throw it in there. Uh, the reason the sangria will last is because you're putting that brandy in there and you're, you're up in the alcohol content and uh, alcohol is a uh, preservative uh, amongst other things. That's why your whiskey and your vodka and your cabinet don't go bad because the alcohol is so high. So uh, you got a little leftover wine, uh, you want to have something to polish it off, have a little party, uh, go for sangria, make it whatever you want. It's a great summertime uh, cocktail. Anything else? And like I said, there's a million sangria recipes online. So uh, do with them what you want. Thank you, Chris. Does anybody else have any other questions for Chris before we sign out for the evening? Nope. Give it up for Candace. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a fun, fun couple of weeks, everyone. Thank you, everybody who's joined us um, for all of the events over the past five weeks. It's been five weeks already. <laughs> I know it's so good to be back in the winery. I just like I missed this place. It's uh, nice to be back in, and I noticed the front room uh, was crowded uh, today, where we where we have the uh, where we have the we can actually serve wine. It, it was full when I came in. So. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And Chris, thank you. Thank you so much for spending, you know, a bit of your Saturday evening with us. This was so informative and such great information. I took about a page of notes. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. well, 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 thanks. You know, it's always hard to tell when you're too close to the forest from the trees, uh, how you're doing. So yeah, hopefully it, was, it, all, uh, it all went well and I didn't bore anybody to death. No, I thought it was really interesting. We're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat and that it was great. Um, so, you know, I, I think it was definitely very well received. And um, everyone that's here, uh, Vegas Valley Winery would like you to know that the um, UNLV 2020 discount code that was valid for this weekend is actually good until next Saturday. So if you would like to stop by and pick up another bottle or two or three or four of their wines. Um, just please make sure and let them know the code UNLV2020 and you will get a discount off of any of the bottles until next Saturday. So make sure you stop by and, and get another bottle of wine. And Chris, thank you so much for, for doing this again. Great hanging out with you guys. And I uh, had a fun time and uh, hopefully we'll see you, around, uh, see you around UNLV doing something. Definitely, definitely. And hopefully we see you at the winery soon. And 
As Maggie said, everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, this has been a great couple of weeks. We are going to be taking a little bit of a break, but we will be back uh, in mid-June um, with some more Click a Rebel and Salute Pros Chairs sessions. So just keep an eye out on your email and uh, social media for when those start back up. And then of course, as always, uh, if you were tasting tonight, if you mixed up some sangria, please tag us in your pictures and follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter at UNLV Hospitality and at UNLV Hospitality Alumni. Um, so have a great evening, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and we will see you in a couple of weeks again when we start back up. Thank you, Chris. See you guys later. Good, to, good being with you.